Right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the International Conference Innovations in the Social Sciences and Humanities at Tondung Tung University. Uh, it's really great to see uh, so many of you here again. And after a successful day yesterday, a few technical glitches, but we, we managed through and, and we had some great discussions. I'm expecting pretty much uh, the same today, good discussion. And um, we're starting off with two great keynotes. Um, Jonathan Bella, who'll be second, I'll introduce him at the time. And uh, this, first up, Ishita Banerjee. And Ishita and I have known each other uh, a long time. I use her work a lot, um, especially her like, um, seeing, capturing, and, and now defining History of Modern India, which is a short book, but the most important uh, on, on, for historians of modern India, the, both as an introduction and the key text now. But she's also written a lot on um, religion, on caste, um, a book on cooking, and, and that's sort of, I guess, related to what we'll hear today, uh, nation, nationalism, um, power, so many things. A recent book on modern Indian sensibilities, uh, edited collection. Um, so I'm really pleased to have Ishita here. I've invited her to other universities I've worked in, so I know the talk will be uh, fantastic. And I'm going to share Ishita's slides. She'll direct me. Um, Culinary food gastronomy tourism, with its primary purpose of exploring food, is acquiring great significance uh, as a vital component of tourism in a world where hunger and deprivation are gaining ground. While food and cuisine are touted as pillars of regional identity and cultural heritage, in Scholars acknowledge the significance of food as a crucial element of material culture that along with the landscape and the body serve as flags for the everyday reproduction, reproduction of the nation and identification. So, um, so <clears throat> what I was saying is that, that food has been taken as one of the, along with the landscape and body as an important element of material culture culture that helps in the flagging of everyday flag, flagging of the nation uh, and uh, you know culture and identity and they, they have been seriously critiqued by others who you know these concept categories as coherent and repositories of affect and identification so i'll take these diverse and opposed perceptions and apprehensions as a point of departure to track the history of food and cuisine through their incessant travels migrations crossing and collapsing of frontiers and blends and concoctions to emphasize the significance of uh, of the diaspora as a concept category instead of food in the diaspora so what I'll push for is that, that the stories, the tales of food and cuisine actually help us think about the diaspora as a concept category. Diaspora in Avtar Bra's suggestive formulation <clears throat> offers a very considered critique of fixed origins, even while it takes into account a homing desire as distinct from a desire for a homeland. The innumerable mixes and transcultural flows of species, spices, ingredients, cooking methods, and people that underline food and cuisine and their diverse deployment enable us to reflect critically on the authentic, the natural, the pure in different contexts and argue against essentialized constructions of the self and the other that lie at the core of aggressive intolerance of different flavors. Without denying the vital presence of power plays and colonial encounters, extravagance and deprivation, innovation and marginalization in the tales of food and cooking, I'll draw lessons from the imagination and intimacy, domestication and adaptation, jumbled identities with a desire for homing that shore up the rich concoctions of dishes and platter to reconsider the many meanings of travel and migration and insist on the importance of acknowledging the diasporic, the hybrid and the composite. 
This section is called the authentic in Indian cuisine. The self-evidence of Indian food across the world with the ubiquitous curry and its as its emblematic representative is conspicuous by its absence within India. This fact has been noted and commented upon by, by scholars who have taken the vibrant presence of regional and ethnic cuisines and the moral and ethical restrictions on the sharing and consumption of food among Hindus in particular to be important factors commenting at the same time that pan-Indian trends are visible in high cuisine of India. Food, an important element of the quiet, everyday flagging of the nation that sustains what Michael Billig has called banal nationalism, banal, sorry, banal nationalism, a routine representation of the nation that conserves a nationalist mood, a shared sense of belonging, latent, palpable and endemic is yet to emerge as an important element of India's current belligerent national culture. Catherine Palmer, among the first to extend Billig's insights on food, argued that food not only served as a flag of identity, along with the national anthem and flag and other recognized symbol, symbols, but gave material force to ordinary people's everyday belonging to the nation through use, consumption, and experience. At the same time, she underlined the presence of ethnic and un other multivariate identities existing in different degrees of harmony and contestation with the national in order to emphasize the gelatinous nature of the national. Let us prove the presence of the gelatinous in different Indian dishes to see whether or not they can bolster the national, the original, the typical. Idli, a widely popular acknowledged representative of South Indian food, originated according to Katie Achaya, the venerable historian of Indian food in the Indonesian region and was brought to India between 800 and 1200 of the Christian era even though references to Idli appeared in Kannada literature from the 10th century up to 1250 CE, three elements of modern Idli making, the mix of grits and urdal, the long fermentation of the mix, and steaming the batter to fluffiness was missing in them. Pointing to the similarity of Idli with Kedli of Indonesia, Ajaya indicated that returning cooks from the Hindu royal kitchens of Indonesia were the likely transporters of the art of fermentation. Lizzie Collingham, on the other hand, credits the Arab settlers in the southern belt of India with the invention of Idli in the seventh century, prior to the advent of Islam in India. Believed to be strict in their diet as new converts to Islam at a time when the prophet was still alive and faced by a serious uncertainty about halal prescribed and, um, uh, halal, uh, for, and, prescribed and forbidden food, these um, uh, Arab settlers cohabiting with Indian women started preparing rice balls as the safest option, which they would flatten slightly and mix with a bland coconut chutney. This simple and pretentious dish was taken over and adapted from the 8th century onwards by various groups and communities in India to result in the wide variety of idlis all over the South, probably with the adaptation of the art of fermentation that came from Indonesia. If Idli offers a succulent example of the presence of the non-native and the inauthentic in the cuisine of the South of India, the recent rivalry between Bengal and Orissa over credit for the invention of rasagulla, that alluring Bengali sweet, brought to light the critical influence of Portugal's, Portuguese style of making the milk curdle in the evolution of rasagulla. Uh, if this makes the fight between Bengal and Orissa over patenting the geographical index of Russia Gulla appear, appear facile, it also underscores the energy, emotion, and pride invested in cooking and cuisine as elements of regional identity. Moving from the regional to the national, it is imperative to take up the multifarious tales of curry, that bastard dish with many possible parents and no clear pedigree emblematic of Indian food all over the world, except in India. Curry, we are aware, stands both for a spicy stew or rag out, if you follow uh, Jane Holt, the New York Times writer of the 1940s, 
So it is curry stands both for a spicy stew made with Indian spices and the yellow powder, a mix of uh, various dry, uh, dry spice with which it is prepared. The crisscrossing tails of curry articulate with flamboyance, the vivacious blends of ingredients, taste, flavor, and innovation that at once create and transcend frontiers and construct and conserve identities of mixed yet bounded communities. While within India, curry is often taken to be a concoction of colonial rule and hel held in disdain by discerning chefs and cooks. For the Anglo-Indian community and people of Indian descent all over the world, curry constitutes a key element of their identity. The way curry, from being the food of the imperial colony, has conquered the imperial palate to become Britain's own, articulate to a certain extent, uh, Fernandez Armesto's argument about the tides of empire that run in two directions. The flow are outward from the imperial center that creates metropolitan diversity and frontier cultures at the ages of empire and the ebb of imperial retreat that carries home colonists with exotically acclimatized palates and releases the forces of counter colonization. It was probably the widely held notion that curry was Britain's own that made it necessary for Deen Muhammad, the owner of the Hindustani coffee house that opened in London uh, in uh, 1893 to claim that his house serves, 1809, sorry, to claim that his house serves Indian dishes of the highest perfection for English nobility and gentry, unmatched by any curry ever served in England. It bears mention in this context that the first curry of dubious credentials had started being served in the Norris Nor Street Coffee House at Haymarket in London as early as 1733. Hobson Jobson, the classic lexicon of Anglo-Indian terms, mentions that curry stuff combination, uh, the combination of spices to prepare curry had become available in England by 1784. Curry stuff was accompanied by the paste to produce maligatani soup, another famous Anglo-Indian dish adopted from the Tamil Milagu Tanni, pepper water. Almost all English cookery books of the 19th century carried recipes of curry, and a day dish made with curry powder had found its way into Isabella Beaton's Book of Household Management, published in 1861, putting the final seal on curry as something British. So early recipe books in Bengali and other vernacular languages that started appearing at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, on the other hand, listed curry as an Indian dish that was specially favored by the Europeans. Prabhga Sundari Dili's Ami Shonid Ami Shahar, published from 1900, offers an interesting example. The section on curry uh, in Prabhga Sundari's volume on non-vegetarian recipes runs into almost 50 pages and 100 entries, far surpassing the other sections. Of even greater significance is the fact that curry comes um, just after kebab with gravy or stewed kebab and wild and domesticated animal flesh. Is kebab or with gravy or stew a reflection of a possible unconscious confusion on the part of an accomplished cook consequent upon the joint influence, uh, influence of Persian, Turco, Afghan, and European food on Bengali cuisine? If we wish to spike up the tale further, we can probe the origins of the word curry, the, uh, curry that has no equivalent in any of the several Indian languages. Joe Monroe, taken cue from The Form of Curry, the title of the first English book of recipes, suggests that curry may be a derivation of the French word queer, which meant to cook, and its British variation, curry. Others indicate that the Portuguese in India were the first to coin a word for the coconut least thick gravy that featured prominently in the palate of the inhabitants of the palm lined coast of the Malabar. Enticed by its taste, they introduced it in their diet and also made up a name for it, karel. Colin Taylor Sen and Lizzie Collingham agree that curry comes from the Tamil word, curry, K -S -K spelled K-A-R-I, but they, do, they are not in accord over what curry in Tamil stands for. 
While Lizzie Collingham equates it to, with something akin to biting, Colin Taylor Sen calls it a spice sauce. The presence of two different R's in Tamil in the language, which with distinction in pronunciation, virtually impossible to discern for non-Tamil speakers may have occasioned such confusion. Curry with the two different R's respectively mean to blacken, to grill and to season. In addition, there is curry pulia, curry leaf, which is widely used in South Indian cooking. In sum, the journey of karel to curry or curry to curry over centuries, mediated by the resourcefulness of Indian cooks and their standoffish British mistresses, the taste and desire of Anglo-Indian families, the influence of variations uh, of curry concocted in Malaysia and Singapore that had the Indian curry as its reference, diverse, delightfully delectable worlds that, we, uh, that need, that merits further exploration. Suffice it to say that such in a mix had induced Lizzie Collingham to pose, the next slide please, to pose two important questions about Indian food in the wake of the controversy occasioned by the proclamation that of Robin Cook that uh, chicken tikka masala was Britain's national dish. Cook was then UK's foreign minister in 2001. And the appearance of upscale restaurants in London and New York that claimed to serve authentic Indian regional cuisine as opposed to the run of the mill curry houses. Lizzie Collingham had asked two important questions. What the first was what authenticity really meant? And two, if authenticity was the right yardstick by which to judge the Indian cuisine. Authentic, it bears mention, entails two different, even opposing con uh, connotations, a true replica of, or done the same way as the original, and as something true of one's personality, um, spirit, character. This adds further complexity to claims of authenticity. In the high culture of international food, uh, writes Ashish Nandi, inauthentic usually has two meanings. Compro compromises made with those who do not belong to the ethnic cuisine on account of commercial or other reasons and adjustments made to recipes to cope with the unavailability or paucity of ingredients. Both meanings, he remarks, draw uh, upon achaya and presume the existence of boundaries that are difficult to, uh, to associate with Indian food since it has openly borrowed from every corner of the globe and transformed the blatantly exogenous to the prototypically authentic. Such borrowings, transformations confer discrete meanings on belonging, identification and effect. Now my last section and the conclusions. This section is called Curry Home Diaspora. The Madhur Jawa free slide, please, John. Thanks. It is time now to track the travels of curry and Indian food in the diaspora to open a dis distinct panorama of nostalgia and contradictory belonging. Let us take Madhur Jafri, a household name in the UK, US and India, and as a versatile author of Indian cookbooks and a television and um, theater personality. As an, exam as an example, Jafri's first book of recipes, An Invitation to Indian Cooking, published in 1973 by Alfred Knopf, became a great success in the US among people not familiar with Indian cooking. Indeed, it was included in the James Bread Foundation's cookbook Her uh, Heritage Fame in 2006. Prior to this, Jafri had been teaching cooking at her Manhattan apartment um, and at a school and had been referred to as, I quote, an actress who cooks in New York Times, in a New York Times article in 1966, following her award-winning performance in the film Shakespeare Wala. Born in Delhi into an aristocratic family of UP Kayas, a middle-ranking Hindu caste with status and prestige in North India, Madhur Jafri had never cooked at home nor did her mother and other women of the family. They supervised food prepared by the cooks employed by the family. It was only when young Madhur went to London to take a course in acting and dis despaired at the blandness of British food that she wrote to her mother to ask for the tasty and spicy recipes of home cooked food. Her mother noted them down on paper and sent them via airmail to her daughter. 
They were to form the basis of Jaffrey's numerous books on Indian cook, uh, uh, cooking. Unsurprisingly, Jaffrey found the curry served in British restaurants unappetizing and abhorred the use of curry powder, a point she makes you know, very affirmatively, very assertively in one of her early books. And yet, as her early years in London lengthened into decades in New York, Jaffrey's um, the, need urge to reproduce the authentic flavors of home changed into a need to introduce the intricacies of Indian cooking in an accessible and easily identifiable way that bore the spirit of the author. In this process, her early loathing of curry and curry powder melted into an acceptance of this omnip uh, omnipresent uh, curry powder and the use of curry powder for easy cooking. Between 1973, and 2010, an, in, an invitation to Indian cooking uh, took a meandering path to reach the ultimate curry Bible, followed by curry easy and uh, uh, curry easy vegetarian and curry easy. Jaffrey's journey that began with a longing and nostalgia for home cooked food that challenged the standardized mongrel Indian food served in second class establishments turned into an acceptance of the necessity of opening out to blends, fusion, and improvisation in praxis, praxis symbolized also by, by her location in her new home in New York. If Madhur Jaffrey resorted to her mother for recipes of food cooked at home, Pushpa Bhargav assumed the role of the universal Indian mom in the next slide, please. Thank you. In giving her daughters in the diaspora US the magnificent gift of a whole range of Indian recipes in 2007. Titled From Mom, mom, From mom with Love, a complete guide to Indian cooking and enter entertainment. This complete guide advised the daughters not only to pay attention to cooking time, style, and ingredients before a meal for guests, but also suggested cooking and freezing in advance as a judicious step to be ready as the welcoming hostess to receive the guests instead of being stuck in the kitchen. A practical tip that takes into account a general practice of many Indian women in the US, but overturns Hindu high caste unease with leftover food as a career of pollution. This twist offers yet another instance of the multiple variations of the authentic represented now in the social and collective self of an ever helpful mother who offers unconditional solidarity to her daughters. The com complete guide ran into a second and third edition within three years of its first publication, offering a rich assortment of recipes that cover distinct parts of India with the, their Indian names. This complete guide transposed home onto, in, uh, onto India in, in a curious situation where the mother is poised between the home in, uh, in India and her home in the diaspora. This allows and this is my last uh, paragraph, this allows a further reflection on the diaspora and in particular, the notion of the diasporic space as the site of intersectionality, the in-between, the inauthentic, instead of an overwhelming association with displacement. In her seminal work, Cartographies of the Diaspora, Avtarbra underscores the dual and qualitatively different significance of home that underlay a question put to her by an all-male panel of Americans interviewing possible students for US universities as to whether she identified herself as an African or an Indian. The first uh, one, home in India, was a simultaneously floating and rooted referent that evoked narratives of the nation, while the home in Africa, Uganda, Uganda in her case, was that of the everyday lived realities, feelings of rootedness that often stem from mundane and unexpected everyday experience and practice that constitute in turn a social and psychic space of belonging of being at home. You know, at the same time, the, this quotidian lived home does not necessarily allow the Ugandan Indian um, a place in the imagined community of the Ugandan nation. Since racialized or nationalist or both discourses make claims that a group settled in a place is not necessarily of it. 
India today makes us painfully aware of the predominance of this exclusionary hierarchical discourse of the nation in its routine construction and perpetration of minorities as settled in, but outside of. Bra develops her idea of the social and psychic diasporic space as one of possibilities, a space that allows one to be both Ugandan and Indian or Indian and American or Indian Muslim and or Muslim Indian or American uh, Native American without being compelled to choose and the possibility of nostalgically evoking distant home and being perfectly at home in another, a possibility that is actually experienced, the, experienced in the contradictory practices of everyday life. The mixed tales of travel, migration, adaption, and innovation I've outlined so far underscore the significance, necessity, and productive possibilities of intersectionality, innate in borrowing, sharing, mixing, and inventing. The delectable blends in food and cuisine um, and the immense agility of adaptation and becoming one's own that enunciate feelings of belonging and being at home open up notions of travel and exploration as well as migration and homing you know, to newer understandings that underscore the contingency and unreality of essentialized constructions and objectified self-identifications. It depends on us to learn from this endeavor, to unsettle the pure, the natural, and the inauthentic, and push for the jumbled, the inauthentic in questioning singular constructions of nation, culture, and identity. Thank you. And thanks, John.